150,000. That's how many drug tests Victoria Police will be conducting over the next year. That means drug testing more drivers in more places more often. It's across all Victoria. TAC, towards zero. I look up into the dark night sky. Listen, all alone, to the cry of the distant sea. 1,000 sutras, the 10,000 treaties, all just waves blown in the wind. That's the voice of a man called Lamb, seconds after one of the craziest, most brazen drug trafficking operations ever went horribly wrong. Okay, okay, okay. Speak slowly, speak slowly. Hey, listen, one is dead. One is dead on the beach. We, we just carry as much as we can. I'm Richard Baker, a journalist with The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald newsrooms in Australia. This is the last voyage of the Pong Su. This is Australian warship. I intend to board you. 150 kilos of heroin, well, that was the greatest quantity that had ever been imported. Straight away, I knew something. I thought to myself, this is his fucking boat. That's not the first time the master's done that. He knew exactly what he was doing. And then, of course, everyone can see a ship. Holy shit. Registration, Romeo, Yankee Hotel, 167. We hunt people like this, and then we're getting close to the kill. Well, I did not do that. I'm not involved, that's all. These people, they expected to be executed. In the middle of the night, just days before the Easter weekend of April 2003, five men were on a wild, lonely stretch of beach on Victoria's shipwrecked coast. The weather was atrocious. And a severe weather warning has been issued for much of Victoria as a cold snap grips the southeast. Three of the men were shoving large packages into a van and a car in a deserted car park above a rock strewn beach. The men were wet, scared, and out of breath. Their conversation, like the voice of Lamb we heard earlier, was captured by a listening device installed by Australian Federal Police in a rented Toyota Tarago van. Their conversations have been translated into English and voiced by actors. How much is left? Put it in the car in front. Don't put it here, carry it. Put it in the front. There's three left. How many have been loaded? Uh, two. Okay, your car should go first. Quick, quick, you car. Wait for me outside the hotel. Hey, 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 hey. I, I can't carry it all. There's so much stuff. <sighs> Three of the five men dashed off into the night in two vehicles loaded with 125 kilograms of heroin. That's at least $100 million worth of gear. 
That left two men at the beach. One was dead, the other somehow alive and very much alone. His name was Tarsar Wong. The two of them, along with all the heroin, had been hurtled out of their small motorised inflatable dinghy by a huge wave they could hear but couldn't see coming. A few hundred metres offshore was an enormous ship pitching wildly in heavy seas. On board were 30 crew, whose futures depended not only on their master winning his battle of wits with the ocean that night, but upon the success of what was unfolding on shore. The crew were from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea, and so was their ship, the motor vessel Pong Su. Within days, these men and the Pong Su would become a big story. The 4,000-tonne Korean freighter Pong Su pursued along the Australian coast in Florida. The crew faced charges related to the importation Suspected of the drug. drug mothership, the Pong Su. Tried by federal police as the mothership, an Asian drug With a cartel. daring raid in heavy seas. Originally offloaded $75 million of high-grade heroin. Street at value of about 220 Off the coast of Lawn in Victoria. The largest heroin seizure may yet get even bigger. Despite all the media coverage and a mammoth court case in Australia, 16 years on, the Pong Su is still holding on to many of her deepest secrets. When it comes to the Pong Su, we only know what's above the surface. And that's a drug bust of epic proportions, a boy's own adventure involving one of the world's most mysterious countries, North Korea. But to confine it to just that, a simplistic tale of good versus evil, where dedicated Aussie cops chase down Asian crooks, ensures the real story of what went down and why will remain submerged. The journalist in me knows the Pong Su has many untold stories in her. I grew up not too far from where all this action happened, and the search for that deeper truth is what compelled me to do this podcast. It's based on hours of secretly bugged conversations, never heard by the public before, and interviews with key players speaking on the record for the first time. To find that deeper truth, what happened and why, we've got to get to know and understand the people, the little fish at the centre of the Pong Su drama. What drove the master of the Pong Su to risk his ship and the lives of his men Why did two men jump into a tiny dinghy in huge seas in the middle of the night? Why did the men waiting ashore to receive the heroin risk 20 years in jail and never seeing their parents again or their kids growing up? And why are some of them still lying about their names and nationality? Who are they protecting? The answers to all those questions lie in accepting a universal truth, that the lives of every one of us are shaped by forces that we rarely see and may never know. For the Pong Su crew, it was the members of the Kim Jong-il regime who directed their operation back in 2003. For the onshore party waiting to receive the drugs, it was the major drug bosses of the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia. For the Australian Federal Police, it was members of the intelligence community who seemed to know more than they did, but wouldn't share it. And for the Pong Su herself, it was the infinite power of the ocean. An unexpected thing happened when I was doing interviews for this podcast. It became clear that despite their great differences, a form of recognition, even respect, 
developed between the Australian police and prosecutors and the North Korean crew. This is very unusual in serious criminal cases. But it seems to me there was at least a shared understanding that whatever side they were on, when it came down to it, everyone was just trying to do their job. The one big difference though, between the Australians and the North Koreans, was the consequences of failure were starkly different. My nickname is Tubes. Tubes? Barry Langan, also known as Tubes, owns the Fruits of the Forest ice cream shop in Lawn. It's the main town closest to where the Pong Su delivered the heroin to shore. Lawn's a beautiful town on Victoria's Great Ocean Road, a winding coastal drive that snakes along part of the southern coast of mainland Australia. For most of the year, Little more than a thousand people live in Lawn, but its population swells many times for a few weeks over the Australian summer. As good as Lawn is in summer, I prefer it in winter, when if it's cold enough, snowdrifts can fall on rainforest covered hills that almost touch the ocean. had it for 55 years, the nickname. <laughs> well, there's a photo of me up there surfing. I never used to put them up and only the last few years, everyone's up. Tubes has surfed up and down Victoria's Great Ocean Road coast all his life. He's also skippered boats far out into Bass Strait, a stretch of ocean that separates mainland Australia from its southern island state of Tasmania. I can't think of anyone who knows more about the ocean in these parts. Well, Bogley Creek's one of the hardest breaking waves along this coast, and they come in right at the wrong spot. And, you know, they couldn't have done it better for stuffing things up for themselves. Bogley Creek is the spot on the Great Ocean Road where Wong and the other man from the Pong Su and their heroine washed ashore with their capsized rubber dinghy 16 years ago. It's where the onshore team of three men were waiting to receive the heroin. They were going by the names of Yao Kim Lam, Kiam Fa Teng, and Chin Kwang Lee. But we'll get to know them by their last names, Lam, Teng, and Lee. Bogley Creek is a 10 to 15 minute drive west from Lawn. There's nothing there except a gravel car park and narrow steps down to a beach covered in jagged black rocks. In ordinary circumstances, it's not a bad spot to do some major drug trafficking, but only so long as the ocean isn't part of the plan. The big rolling swell, when it's eight foot inshore, it's hellish and big roll offshore, just offshore in it. Whether they get surf in North Korea, I don't know, but they wouldn't have been used to anything like that, and it would have been a nightmare for them. Tube speaks from experience. He nearly died once surfing at Boggley Creek. Yeah, well, we went out at Boggley Creek and it was solid six to eight with 10 foot sets now and again coming. And that was quite solid, really good surf and it was really clean. I had it all to myself. And I took off on this wave and I got a really big bottom turn and got to the top and I everything seemed to stop. And, and I sort of, thought I'm not going to get back down the wave all of a sudden it jacked and I got lip launched and it just threw out and it threw me and I did like a Greg Laganus roll like with my neck going with my head between my knees rolling and I thought Jesus you know what's happening here and I landed eventually he surfaced lungs bursting eyes stinging only to see the big set about to land on top of him then the wave whacked and held me under. And I thought, I'm saying to myself, hang on, hang on, you, you know, I was out of air. And it, hold on, it was long and I'm squeaking and sort of licking out whatever other air I had. And I managed to get up to the top and just got one mouthful. And then the next big set came and bombed me. I 
really thought I was going to drown. And this is what would have happened to those guys. A word from our sponsor. 150,000. That's how many drug tests Victoria Police will be conducting over the next year. That means drug testing more drivers in more places more often. It's across all Victoria. TAC, towards zero. Smythe Real Estate Lawn, Donna speaking. Donna Venables was working at the real estate agency in Lawn's main street back in 2003. I remember a, a Tarago van pulling up out the front of the office, which I could clearly see, and I remember an Asian man coming into reception who was quite uh, shaky or a little bit on edge. Um, he was requesting a holiday rental fairly urgently. What was his English like? Not great, but okay for me to understand. They were requesting a three to four bedroom house and I remember suggesting a house which was in Allen Street in Lawn, but they required linen and they didn't have linen on them and I was a little bit, um, I just thought they were a bit dodgy so I had an instinct of not to, to lease them something in the end. Subject having a cigarette out the front. Time is 4.51 on the 11th of April, 2003. Donna's instincts were spot on. The police were already on the case. Outside the agency, plain-clothed Australian Federal Police officers watched and filmed the men from across the road. Registration, Romeo Yankee Hotel 167. His associate in the driver's side of the Tarago. Real estate agent Smythe on Mount Joy Road, Lawn. It's the main street of Lawn. There was a guy acting suspiciously at the Crown Casino complex, so that's where we picked him up. Uh, so this was Ting. Des Appleby is a veteran AFP agent and an expert in organised crime. He led the Pong Su investigation. My producer Rachel and I spent a couple of days with him in Hong Kong, where he's the Australian Federal Police Senior Liaison Officer. Des is genial, broad-shouldered and dark-eyed. You can tell he gets a thrill out of catching crooks. He's a 50-minute ferry ride away from the autonomous region of Macau, Asia's gambling mecca, where the Mr Bigs of the drug trade give orders and make millions. A big part of Des's job is trying to disrupt the flow of drugs from Asia on their way to Australia. From his office in downtown Wan Chai district, Des has a panoramic view of Hong Kong Harbour, where hundreds of cargo ships pass through each day. But back in 2003, Des was only interested in one ship. He was appearing to be waiting around for uh, something to happen. And the Pongsu uh, case began when Australian authorities were alerted to a short, wiry, middle-aged man staying at Melbourne's Crown Casino. This guy was Teng. And uh, he had a, every hallmark of a what we call a shore party member just waiting for something to happen. So that he was the target. He was the one that we, we, we basically started the job on. We'll hear a lot more from Des as this podcast goes on. But for now... All Des and his team had to go on was that this guy Teng was up to something sus. They had no idea there was a huge North Korean cargo ship steaming towards the Victorian coast. What they did know was that Teng and a colleague had rented a Toyota Tarago and were spending a lot of time around lawn. And so they began following. We'll get to know Teng much better later on as well. All we need to know now is that in a story about the little fish, Teng is the tiniest minnow.
Back in Lawn, the locals were unaware their quiet town was about to become the location for a real-life action movie with international ramifications. You want a beer? I'll get it for you. Nah. No, no, I'll get it for you. But you don't get my price. I'll get, I'll get them you. cheap. That's Say it's for Dick. Say it's for yeah, VB. I've got my own um, name on the till. Have you? Yeah. You've got your little tab there. My own button. Just gold, say it's a bit stubby for Dicky. Just right, what you've got to say. Dicky Davies is one of Lawn's well known characters. A lot of blokes will go to. You can't buy Carlton Draft, you can only buy all this boutique shit. He's a builder, a barroom storyteller, and, like Tubes, a dedicated surfer and fisherman. We met at the Lawn pub, where you can find Dicky most afternoons after knockoff. It's all this prickly Moses and all this other. Craft, f- yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Fuck, it shits me. Just it's got me fucked. And not everybody's a bloody yuppie, you know. Yeah. Dicky and the rest of Lawn's locals are used to seeing container and freight ships pass by on the horizon on their way through the notorious rip into Port Phillip Bay to Melbourne. It's part of daily life. But when the Pong Su appeared, it was something uh, else. It was a weird looking boat. Yeah, what did it look like? Uh, it was massive. It was pretty big. It was like one of that, you know, that, that, those fishing shows you have on see on TV where they're fishing in the Baltic Straits and all that for those crabs and all that. Nose comes right up like this and it, like a couple of masts on it. But it was a massive one like that. Like a big steel fucking thing. Like it was a big boat. See down there that across the, the first building over the grass down there? Yeah. That's the swimming pool. That's how far off the rocks it was. Dickie's pointing towards the lawn swimming pool, which is a few hundred metres from the pub balcony. I can see it clearly. That's how close the 100 metre long Pong Su got to the rocks, in conditions that were far from calm. The swell was the biggest seen for a few years. And that's saying something, considering this coastline has some of the wildest surf in the world. But I knew you wouldn't miss a 50-year storm, Bodie. Yeah. The Bells Beach that Patrick Swayze's character Bodie from the classic 90s film Point Break made it his life's mission to get to is less than an hour's drive from Lawn. Anybody been out there? No one's been out, no one's going out. It's going to be fucking crazy, man. Seth on a stick out there, mate. Every Easter, Professional surfers from around the globe come to Bells as part of the World Championship Tour. The 2019 event was spectacular and dangerous. All the surfers having to bail out. Ooh, big old hunk of white water rolling through here. And it looks like we might have a couple of broken boards here. Oh! Oh! Look at that. Love it. Five to 13 feet. All my life I've lived here and I've never seen a boat. I was like, what the fuck are you going to get washed on the rocks? That was my first impression. Then I thought, oh, no, he's broken down, the poor bastards. They're, they're probably Mayday for help. Dickie saw the Pong Su just hours before Wong and his mate were sent overboard in the dinghy to take the heroin ashore. I go and check the surf out after work or whatever. Before work, I drive around behind the pier. Anyway, for some, and all of my life, boats, ocean liners or whatever, a fair way out to sea, like miles out, you know. For some reason, I go around behind the pier this afternoon, and here's this boat, probably 500 to, metres to a kilometre off the rocks. And I'm thinking this, this boat's either broken down, or in distress, or it's something sus. I didn't think anything of it. And then, the following morning, I get the paper, I go around behind the pier to see if the swell had picked up. I got to the other opposite the Lawn Hotel here. Here's about 80 federal cops just in the middle of the road, got blokes hunched over the booty cars like this, there's Chinese blokes like this. There's coppers just everywhere. I'm just going, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> It, it was full on, like there was that many cops, it was ridiculous. So I kept going around behind the pier, and there's cops all around there as well. Next thing there's cops with jet skis, towing jet skis, cops with rubber duckies on the back of their cars, all federal, Australian federal police. I just thought, what, what the f- 
fucking federal cops, what's going on? I shit myself, like I thought I'd done, you know, you, as soon as you see cops, you shit yourself. <laughs> well, I do anyway. <laughs> Although he'd never seen anything like this before, he instantly knew what was behind it. So straight away I knew something, I thought to myself, this is this fucking boat. The federal police never found all of the heroin that was brought ashore that night from the Pong Su by Wong and his friend. Although 125 kilograms was seized, 25 kilograms was never recovered. This missing package is worth millions of dollars. I went, just, I go, I'm a keen gar fisherman, and right where they tried to smuggle the dope into shore, it's called Boggley, Boggley Creek. And that's a very good gar hole, is right at Boggley Creek. Well, for months I'd go down there and get me bloody dozen gar fish for a feed, or whatever, and there'd be coppers down there, looking for shit on the beach, down there in rubber ducky, scanning the area for months and months, well, nearly two years. You'd see federal police. They were in the area. And they were looking for that oh, missing dope. Yeah, well, that, yeah, because uh, people reckoned I wasn't going gar fishing. <laughs> I was looking for the dope, which it would have been nice to find. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't good. still be a carpenter if I found it in here. <laughs> <laughs> When I think about everything that happened that night and how the drug delivery from the Pong Su to the men waiting at Boggley Creek went so wrong, the person I think about most is Wong. What he was doing was illegal and very likely would have led to the deaths of dozens of Australians through overdoses. But over the course of researching this story, I, like some of the police who pursued Wong, came to admire his toughness. I couldn't help but wonder, given the way things work in North Korea, if he really had a choice. He's the guy who had to get into the rubber dinghy dropped over the edge of the Pong Su, and along with his mate, take 150 kilograms, or around 330 pounds, of heroin ashore in darkness and fierce swells. He's the one who survived the dumping waves, then managed to drag his dead friend ashore. He's the one who helped find five out of the six heroin packages and get them to the three waiting onshore party members, Lam, Lee and Tang. He's also the one who was left behind. Wong watched the trio drive off into the night, and then it was just him, the dead guy, and the ocean. With the dinghy's motor out of action, he had no way of getting back to the Pong Su. He had no passport or identity documents on him. He was left with a GPS device, a Nokia mobile, alcohol, and a few cigarettes. He didn't know what had become of the shore party, though he probably suspected the worst the next morning when he saw dozens of police swarm Boggley Creek. For now, all Wong could do was take cover, watch, and hope the Pong Su wouldn't leave without him. Coming up on the last voyage of the Pong Su. It was clear that he was up there uh, communicating back to the vessel. Our relationship with the DEA, both in Australia and offshore, is very, very close. I mean, a master has ultimate control of his ship. He knows exactly what is happening to his ship. He knows where, where his ship is at any one time. All of the communist parties today have a job to do. You know? They have also control to the, see the people. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is brought to you by the newsrooms of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. To read more and to watch the videos referenced in this episode, head to our websites.
While you're there, why not take out a subscription to help power independent Australian journalism and productions like this podcast? If you're enjoying this series, leave a review on iTunes and recommend us to a friend. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is reported by Richard Baker. Field recording and audio editing by executive producer Rachel Dexter. Narrative consultant is Kate Cole Adams. Siobhan McHugh is consulting producer. Music and composition by Vicky Hansen. Sound design and mixing by John Greenfield. And Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Thanks to our cast of actors, Chi Kwan Lee is played by Andy Song. Kyung Fa Teng is played by Anthony Ting. And Yao Kim Lam is played by Jason Chong. Casting by Catapult Casting. Script translations by Yan Zhuang. Additional audio from Largo International NV, World Surf League and Sky News. The poem you heard at the start of this episode is titled Waves by South Korean poet Cho Oh Hyun, read by Jason Chong. 